Okay, kids, I know why you're here. You're here because of this. Heat 2, the sequel to Heat, the classic 1995 Al Pacino, Robert De Niro heist movie. When I was reading this book out in public and whatnot, like more than once, I was talking to some random bro and our conversation would end with both of us going, best, 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 movie, best, of best, movie, of best movie of all time. So this isn't Michael Mann's first book. He did a photography book with some cat, but this is his first novel that he's written alongside Meg Gardner, who's won some awards for her writing, also a former Jeopardy champion. And she writes suspense novels, which is helpful here, this being a, a crime thriller. I'm going to assume that you've seen Heat since you're watching this. And if, you, if you're watching this and you haven't seen Heat, then watch, just watch it. It's free on YouTube. But if you have seen it and you don't want to read the novel in order to figure out what happens, so you're like, well, this guy who clearly isn't fitting to read things, he's probably going to tell me all about this book and all the spoilers. That's right. That's what I'm going to do. So if you don't want any of that, you should probably just skip off the video now. But if you do want to hear some of my like critiques and reflections on the book, then you can click right over here and um, I'll just jump right into that. In the meantime, let me tell you what happens in Heat 2. Now, this movie book, the jumps time, you know, back and forth. First time period is 1988. The second time period is 96, directly after the events of the movie. And then the final portion is in the year 2000. I'm not going to tell you the story as it's written. I'm going to tell you each time period individually. In 1988 in Chicago, there's this crew of people that are terrorizing upper middle class citizens. It's five cats led by a guy named Otis Wardell, who in a perfect world would be played by Tony Soprano, um, James Gandolfini, but alas, we do not live in a perfect world, so. His whole MO is like going into these rich people's houses, getting all the valuables that they have, starts killing the husband, raping the, the wife and all the girls and stuff and starts torturing them and it's, it's a whole thing. That's like what he lives for. He wants to destroy these people but he's so good at like seeing into human beings that he really could have been a great social worker <laughs> in another life if his mother didn't screw him up or something. I guess his mother ruined him or abused him as a kid so now he's just super petty all the time. Like, and he makes all of his associates really nervous because he just is an attention hound. Like if he doesn't get all their attention, he feels slighted. And if he feels slighted, he feels, you know, murdery. So Al Pacino was kind of on his case, just following clues and whatnot, just doing the whole, you know, heat thing. But at the same time in 88, De Niro and crew are laying on a score for this bank where they have like this vault that holds, um, it's got like safety deposit boxes for uh, like different criminals, crime families in the city of Chicago. He's got pretty much all weekend because they have no guards over the weekend and there's no cameras in the vault room. So he's gonna go in through the side, in through the building next to it and then drill through that wall directly into the vault. And then they have all weekend long to just crack open safety deposit boxes and empty out the valuables and such. Now both of these crews, Soprano's crew and De Niro's crew, they both get their work cars from the same cat. And De Niro doesn't like talk to anyone that he doesn't have to talk to because and because that's how loose ends are created. When T Soprano notices that this mysterious Highline crew from the coast is getting attention from his guy, he gets really petty and starts trying to like, cracking at them, what the, what the heck are they doing over there, huh? Why, why are you using my guy? That kind of thing. Pacino is working the case, yada yada, and he, he finds out where the next score is going to be. Some house, uh, you know, wife, kids, it's the same, same deal. It's gonna be beautiful, he's gonna ruin everything. So what Pacino does is get his whole crew, uh, and instead of, you know, arresting them and bringing them to justice, they hide and wait until the crew gets inside the house. Pacino's crew just starts lighting them up. Whatever, who cares, right? But that's not really how policing is supposed to go, but it's not like Michael Mann doesn't know what he's talking about. It just really kind of bothered me. There's so much more of that side of, of 
Pacino's character in this book where it's like you're not supposed to behave that way as a cop he's like torturing people like abusing people as a cop and it's okay because he's a cop no Tony Soprano survives the shootout he's the only person to survive and gets away um, and De Niro's bank job goes out absolutely perfectly they leave with like a bunch of cash and these compute a stack of computer disks which kind of jumps out as like interesting and this is like 88 right so i'm going to assume that by computer disks he means like five and a half inch floppies and so he takes it to uh, john voigt and the guy in the wheelchair you know kelso from where they got the bank where they got the bank job from de niro says that it was in a lot of box with uh with stuff from the Herrera cartel after doing some light hacking they noticed that the documents on this floppy disk are a ledger of money deliveries going from Chicago to the Herrera's stronghold cash house in Mexico. That's like the implicit, the next score. It'd be about 12 million on a good day. That sounds like fun, right? So in order to plan that gig, De Niro gets a whole bunch of work cars from this guy, like a big old um, car transporter and some cars inside of it. And at that same time, Tony Soprano was holed up in the guy's workshop. Uh, trying to run from Pacino and him. So when he sees Pro leave with all those cars, he gets bent up like, where's that going? Why is somebody doing all this work with my guy? This guy is, you know, sworn to secrecy from De Niro. And he's also kind of pissed at Tony for, you know, stinking up his office with his life and everything. So that kind of goes sideways. They get into a big argument that ends with the work car bro being tortured to death and like burnt to a crisp, hung on a meat hook in the middle of his garage. So that by the time Pacino finds out where where Tony's getting his work cards from and goes to meet with that guy, he finds him, you know, all burnt up, his balls torched off of his body. And so gruesome, Pacino's like, you know what, I, I, I quit. So De Niro is just laying on the score for the, for the Herrera's cash house. And at this point, you really, really see just how tight that crew is at how to knock over scores testing security and such because the Herreras they get their they have their money somewhere in Mexicali their cash house is this Chinese themed motel that's just busted down and broken down all the surrounding buildings for like a few blocks out are empty so they can see anybody who doesn't belong there because if anyone's there they don't belong there so they can they really have the place locked down they have cops on payroll so we can prowl around and see if anything's out of place. Okay, so De Niro has a girlfriend who we'll call Ava Mendez. Uh, so she's gonna help them um, going back and forth, getting the money out. In the meantime, Tony is scouring the Southwest to find that big old car transporter to, you know, out of spite to get at Neil. De Niro and his crew, they all just rainbow six the cartel out of like $12 million. It doesn't go perfectly. It's a really cool, really cool scene. You can see just how much a cut above this crew is. So Tony finds her hiding spot and uh, kills Eva Mendez's uncle, um, but doesn't know that her daughter is like hiding because her daughter was like hiding in there. Ava tries to like get them out of their safe house, but Tony hangs by because he has like a, you know, a sixth sense for like people's intentions. He knew something was up. Um, I mean, the guy's great. He's, he's my favorite character in this, in this story, by the way. The new, the new, you know, Tony Soprano was such a good character. In the same way that Wayne Grow, like, was like a really, like, you, I mean, you hated Wayne Grow, right? But you gotta admit, he was captivating for that movie. Um, Wardell really does um, replace him here. So Tony gets Ava Mendes in a trick bag, forces her by shotgun to, to take her to where De Niro is. To just screw his stuff up. He doesn't know, you know, how much money that they have or are planning to get. He just wants to screw his stuff up. Um, so she has to communicate to De Niro's crew using a screwed up version of their code language to tell them that something is missing. So that's the, that that she's caught up, and and he he gets it kind of quick that something is wrong. Their communications are. Are, are messed up I and mean, they need to save her. So she gets him in a shootout going to this place that's like notorious for smugglers to get hijacked and messed up. So he's like on like a hill or something and picking off his whole crew again. And he, and Tony has her at the shotgun and, and De Niro barters for her life with like a, the car that he's in has three million of the 12 million that he was able to get away with. They would have gotten more, but it all went left. So they left with 12 million, not bad. He gives 
Tony the car with, with the three million in exchange for her life, but Tony kills her anyway, drives off. And that's, that's the 88 storyline. Jumping to 96, directly after the events of the movie, Valerie Kilmer is in bed with a shot in his neck. Um, and he has an out plan for him by John Voight. Um, he's gonna get smuggled out to Mexico, then go to Paraguay to work security for this guy who um, John Voight was sold up with. And so as a favor, they're going to take care of Val. And in Paraguay, like, it's kind of a free trade zone. It's a business family, and they're doing mall security, right? At this place where they just sell stolen goods or whatever. Um, and Val, of course, knows how to spot when somebody's taking the joint out, but he doesn't really know what they're going after unless he knows what the family he's working for is actually doing. So he notices these guys are like taking the joint out and like messing with like looking at like their cables and, and stuff, but doesn't know really what they're trying to do because he doesn't know the full extent of the family. So he's eventually told that the family sells military grade defense uh, systems which aren't illegal in Paraguay but as far as internationally they could be considered a crime family so he climbs their rank proving his worth in the family by scoping out this guy that he was driving for a meeting who was supposed to be this like ex-military contractor to do this uh, deal but the guy was all wrong he, he didn't behave like someone who was doing something dangerous he didn't understand American military cultural things he didn't understand it, so the guy was an actor, and Val scoped that out. And his direct boss didn't believe him, but he was able to get in front of the head of the family with some other like kind of like action stuff he did, yada yada. And he took that opportunity to tell the big boss that the guy he's meeting is a phony, and told him why. And it worked out, and he had to kind of take over that guy's place and like kind of be a spy. The fake was working for a other family, their business rival, who wanted to steal their um, software. They were able to, I guess, like mess their stuff up, giving them like a software that had a, a virus in it that would ruin their whole system and make their hardware unable to work, something like that. Also, he's like sleeping with a daughter who's like, um, like should be the successor to the business, but since she's a woman, they shrug her off and they're stupid son who just wants to party all the time is gonna be trained as the successor, yada yada, you know, family stuff. Okay, let's jump to 2000, which you know he's a chick dead and half eaten by wildlife out in like the valley off the freeway. So he's running major crimes and he's kind of spinning out like his life isn't going too well. Trying to take less Adderall, he's fully divorced now. Val and his girlfriend is She's doing her own thing, not under the family. So Girlboss and Valerie are taking a trip to LA to do some deal with her uncle up there. And Val has like a fake passport and all that so he can find the radar okay. And Tony Soprano took the money from uh, De Niro and started running motels down in the hundreds for the Figueroa track just to turn out tricks. So the gang's all here, pretty much. Big finale set up. Everyone's at the same place at the same time. Okay. This is also the point where I stopped caring so much, so this might this might go back kind of fast. Alright. Pacino recognizes Tony's MO with that girl that was dead. So there's like this pimp that uh, Tony is looking for because he was like shorting his uh, take. That's because Tony killed that girl that was his girl so he's like well I can, I'm gonna get my money back because you took my girl so that's that's why that. But So Tony does his old ultra, ultra violence thing against the girl that sold a girl saw that girl to the pimp. And so Tony's going to that girl to find the pimp, but he's, he decides I should probably kill her because she knows too much. And so he does his old, he does his old routine over there. Yeah, at the same time, the girl boss is in, ends up in a trick bag because her uncle and brother are gonna commandeer the business from her because she was doing too well. You know how that goes. Yeah, she ends up like screwing up their whole business though. Um, using Kelso, like they, they get together and do some like deep web thing to like screw their thing up. I don't, I don't really know how that happened. I was just trying to finish the book at that point. Val kind of wants to get together with Ash Ashley Judd, but she has a whole life together and he feels like it would be messed up. So he just kind of lets it go. That's not what Ashley Judd wants, but that's what Val thinks is best. So that's just his decision. Evan Mendez's daughter recognizes Tony Soprano 
at the place that she works as a diner. You know, through Tony's sixth sense, realizing that the waitress just left suddenly and looking really messed up. He's like, oh crap, that's Gabriella from the locket or whatever. So he has to go and kill Gabriella. And she files a report. It reports him at the Hollywood office. So Pacino tries to keep her safe, but she ends up getting caught by Tony. When she gets caught by Tony, then Pacino is directly on Tony's tail, but also Val is directly on Pacino's tail because Val wants to kill Pacino because Pacino killed De Niro. At the end of the movie, you saw the daughter ends up causing a crash in the freeway to try to escape from Tony. And so Tony's all bloodied up. There's a big old pile of people who can't move in the freeway now. And then Tony is following her with a gun a shotgun to try to kill her. But also, Val is on the other side of the freeway, like laying in wait to, kind of, to try to catch Pacino, but then he notices that Gabriella, who he recognizes from back in the day, is getting sh shot up by Tony. So he's like, you know, tries to, he lays covering fire trying to save her, and does end up saving her, giving uh, Pacino enough time to run up and uh, have a battle with Tony, ends up killing Tony. Val lets Pacino go, the girl boss gets it, makes a ton of money, yeah, Val gets away clean, yep, the end, good movie. I give it four stars, and I would give it like 15 based on how much I enjoyed it, like I enjoyed the crap out of it in the middle. Like I was so caught up with like how they planned the scores. The reason I can't give this book five stars is because it just felt weird, like from the jump it felt like the voice of the narrator was distinct in a way where it shouldn't be. It kind of felt like Michael Mann was giving me the elevator pitch or like the description of what he wants the movie to look like instead of using the medium of literature and what that can do to paint the picture in the head. He tries, it's almost as if he only knows through words how to explicitly explain what the visual will be instead of instead of letting descriptions create an implication and that implication can bloom in your imagination into a more vivid picture a more powerful picture than can be explained through word salad which is kind of what we get here i'm reminded of El Dorado red by donald goins which is maybe the most similar book that i've read which is another heist book and to be honest i kind of felt the same that when i was done reading it i was just absolutely finished it was like you know fast food i read it really fun ride now i just have to go and think of something else at the end of el dorado red when buddy is killed and the stuff's in the back of the car because his friends think that he made a irresponsible purchase with his money from their scores, making all of them super hot they killed him and put him in the car but none of that is explained in the novel, the only thing that they, the only thing that's explained is that his father gave him the car, and at the end of the movie, Buddy's in the trunk of it when it's parked outside of his friend's hideout when they get lit up by his father's goons. So that's kind of like an example of like, if I explained that clearly, I hope I did. There's something of like an inexperience with the medium appearing in this book, which is you know expected. It's fine, I think. Uh, once I got over, like, I guess a bit of snobbery in that, I was able to just enjoy it. But also, I kind of felt like there's too many words on the page as well. Like, when he's explaining stuff about characters, like, I get that Mike wants to expand on the backstory with all these characters, yes. But I don't need to know everything about everything. Like, when he brings up Danny Trejo. Out of his window, the Ford F-150 pickup truck pulls even with him in the left lane. The man at the wheel. As hard a con as Neil has ever met, gives him a glance and accelerates. Trejo is cool and crafty and fit, and nobody who sees him behind the wheel with that black glare would believe how tenderly he can smile at his wife. I don't need to know any of that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't need to know anything about it. Don't bring his wife into this. Uh, he's cool, crafty, fit. Like, just show me. Don't tell me. And that happens all the time in this book. He's telling me stuff, but he can just show me it. But, like, he just doesn't know how with the medium. I think that's what it comes down to for most of my gripes. That being said, I still had a major blast with it to where it felt weird, like having to knock it down to a four because I was like thrilled to get back to reading this book because I'm like, how do they do this? How, do, how does it end? You know, I need to know about the score. I felt like the, like the big action set pieces, like when 
Pacino was trying to gun down uh, Tony's crew in 88 and at the end with that big firefight on the Pada freeway, that was underwhelming because there was too much trying to explain chaos as it's seen instead of how it's ex experienced. You get what I'm saying? Because if you can explain chaos as it's experienced, you can transfer that sense of like uh, confusion and fear and that um, contraction of attention and uh, that the adrenaline increases that, that sends you to fight, fight, flight and freeze. But instead, we just get um, a almost a medical explanation of events, but the, the, the talking and the character work, of course, is magnificent. If thinking about Al Pacino's opinion of Ashley Judd's ass puts a smile on your face, you're going to love this book. <laughs> because there's plenty of moments of just that fantastic dialogue that comes through. So anyway, I don't know anything about Meg Gardner. I don't know what her role is in this, because I would love to say that it's on her to like help him explain what he can do with the medium. But is it really, is it really her job? I don't think so. I don't know. I don't know how that working relationship went. I never read anything from her, so it's whatever. But uh, Michael Mann has a three book deal with this imprint. So I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that we can probably expect, or at least I very much hope, that we're gonna get a Miami Vice story out of this. That would be tight. But um, I mean, it'll be what it is, right? What, what other screenplays does he have just lying around in his office that he just has never gotten around to doing, right? I wonder. That's kind of what we're sitting here for. So that's the story, folks. Read the book, or I guess if the movie's out already, watch the movie or something. So I'll probably watch the movie too when it happens. All right, y'all, that's that. You know what the most dangerous thing in America is, right?